Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today I'll be giving you all an in-depth look at my 1948 Ford Super Deluxe. Before we get started, I'd like to extend a huge thanks to O'Reilly Auto Parts for supporting the channel. Next time you're working on your project or need to get some maintenance done, definitely check out O'Reilly. I've got a link to their website down in the description below. As with all of my reviews, I'm going to cover all of the ins and outs and take this thing on a thorough drive. There's a whole lot of stuff to cover, so without further ado, let's go ahead and start her up and let her run. This generation of Ford passenger car was first launched for 1941, and at least for the general public was offered for five model years. Production was halted after 1942 due to World War II and resumed once again for 1946. When these cars first came out, they were an extraordinary jump ahead in terms of construction, quality, performance, and value. Entirely new bodies offered a significant increase in seating width. Combined with longer wheelbases and larger overall dimensions, these cars were also the roomiest Ford had ever built. Sedans could carry as much as six adults without issue. Along with being more practical and comfortable, the dimensional changes improved drivability and riding comfort. The body was a streamlined design with a long front end, wide fenders, and a tall roof line. The running boards on 1941 models were almost completely concealed, a big departure from Fords of previous years. They became fully concealed in 1942. Visibility was improved compared to earlier cars thanks to a larger windshield and more expansive side glass that increased glass area by as much as four square feet. The large one-piece curved design of the rear window helped improve rearward visibility. Improved gearing allowed for better performance regardless of whether you had the standard 6 or the optional V8. Over the years, additional improvements were made to bolster performance and economy. An all-new, stronger frame offered twice the rigidity and twisting force to help keep the body quiet and secure, improving refinement and safety. Ford's policy had always been to build a car that would deliver good service at a low cost. After 40 years of keeping to that goal, Ford cars had achieved a worldwide reputation for dependable service and economical operation. These cars in particular offered a high level of quality and precision that only got better as the years went on and remained extraordinarily thrifty. An all new lineup of Ford passenger cars was introduced for 1949. Between 1946 and 1948, most of the changes were cosmetic, including trim, lighting, emblems, and more. There were two core models, Deluxe and Super Deluxe. The trim and engine was indicated by the emblem on the front of the hood. The main differences were details of finish and appointments. The Super Deluxe had full body trim and more interior features. It also offered a greater choice of body styles. While the Deluxe was offered in three body styles, the Super Deluxe offered six, including a station wagon and a convertible. This body style was referred to as the Tudor Sedan. It offered very similar accommodations to the four-door sedan, aside from having two less doors, and was a favorite among families with smaller children, as you had all of the comfort and utility of a large car, but you didn't have to worry about children accidentally opening a rear door. 
Ford did offer automatic rear door safety locks as an option on the four-door. If equipped, a spring-actuated locking mechanism would have been built into the car's center post, which made it impossible for the rear doors to open if the front doors were closed. The Deluxe and Super Deluxe were available in a wide range of optional colors at no extra cost. I believe this color was known as Shoal Green. All of the colors were enduring, high-gloss baked enamel that was touted as being highly resistant to fogging or dimming. The original starting price for a 1948 Deluxe Tudor sedan with the standard six-cylinder engine was $1,212. If you wanted a V8, the price rose to $1,288. A Super Deluxe Tudor sedan with the six-cylinder started at $1,309, while a V8 model came in at $1,382. Ford offered these cars with quite a lot of optional extras, including styling, convenience, and safety features. While I don't know what the total price of this specific car would have been, it was very well equipped. Some of the exterior extras shown here include the bumper end guards, side view mirrors, and reverse light. There's a bunch of other cool stuff throughout as well. Some of the things I'll show in this video are almost impossible to find nowadays, which makes this car quite special. All of Ford's passenger cars for 1948 were fitted with 15 by 6 inch steel wheels, 4 ply tires, and polished partial wheel covers that featured the Ford script. The wheels were painted to match the color of the body. Outer beauty rings were available to further dress the wheels up. This car has a modern set of 235-75 radial tires with a period correct vulcanized white wall. These tires are bigger than what the car would have had originally. In 1948, white walls would have been an optional extra. Oversized 12-inch drum brakes with 162 square inches of lining area provided powerful straight-line stopping power for their day and boasted a long service life. The drums are the same diameter at each corner. It's a manual braking setup with the master cylinder mounted underneath the car. A built-in, self-centering feature for the brakes provided positive shoe alignment for smooth, quiet action and soft pedal pressure. The parking brake is operated by a lever underneath the left side of the dash. For greater braking power and less pedal pressure, Ford offered an optional brake booster that amplified the pressure put on the brake pedal to assure quick, sure stops with a minimum of driver effort. The unit was self-contained and entirely automatic in operation. The car's foundation begins with a massive one-piece welded X-member that forms deep box section side rails and a slight drop in right height compared to 1940 models for a more road-hugging and solid feeling. The torque tube drive, wide track and balance weight distribution resulted in improved drivability, safety and more predictable control compared to earlier cars. Lateral stabilizers, front and rear, in combination with a front ride stabilizer resulted in a unique two-way stabilization system. This steadied the car when driving in a crosswind and on turns, even at higher speeds. Extra strength and safety were engineered into all parts of the welded steel body. It was referred to as the lifeguard design. The long, transverse, slow-action multi-leaf springs do an excellent job in smoothing out road irregularities for a pretty smooth and level ride. Fabric-lined metal covers on the Super Deluxe models helped retain lubricant for a more uniform spring action, keeping dirt and water out. The spring design, combined with double-acting hydraulic shock absorbers and a relatively low center of gravity, helped set a new standard in riding comfort. Even though it seems like a primitive design, it's extremely stout and a really cool sight to see. It doesn't lend much benefit in the handling department, though, as there's significant body roll, but that's to be expected. It's a comfortable, relaxed cruiser. The steering is a manual worm and roller setup with an 18.2 to 1 ratio and an 18 inch diameter steering wheel. 
as you would expect being a larger car, the steering does take a lot of effort at lower speeds. Higher speeds aren't a big deal because you already have the car moving. The turning diameter is 41 feet. There's a little bit of play in the steering, but that's pretty typical too. Overall, I do like how the steering feels. It's a substantial feeling, and the large diameter steering wheel gives you extra leverage for turning. A powered steering system was not available on these cars. The full horn ring was exclusive to the Super Deluxe. For as large as these cars were, they didn't weigh as much as you might expect. In fact, the Tudor sedan had a claimed shipping weight of 3,190 pounds. Ford offered two engine options in 1948. This car has the optional 239 cubic inch or 3.9 liter flathead V8 engine, which was the most powerful engine ever offered in a Ford car at the time developing 100 horsepower at 3,800 RPM and 180 pound-feet of torque at 2,000 RPM. Top speed, depending on the rear axle ratio, was around 85 miles per hour. This particular engine was fully rebuilt in 2014. At the time, it was bored slightly over and gained an upgraded camshaft for improved low and mid-range power. There were other enhancements as well, but from the outside, it's as stock as can be except for the chrome dress-up acorn covers on the head stud nuts. This car is so much fun to drive. It won't win any races, but it has respectable power for what it is, especially around town. I ended up ditching the muffler a while back to really let the engine sing. The flathead V8s have such a unique sound to them, especially this one being that it's been hopped up some. It's quite aggressive. When Ford relaunched these cars in 1946, they made a number of improvements to the V8 to make it even more enticing, such as improved manifolding, improved valve seat cooling, a higher capacity oil pump, plus other improvements to virtually affect every operating part of the engine. There were also improvements to the cooling system to make things more efficient and help minimize the loss of water and antifreeze due to evaporation a waterproof ignition coil and distributor, and dual automatic spark control led to better reliability and better performance when using different grades of fuel. A long life voltage regulator automatically controlled the generator output to maintain the battery in a charge condition. These cars were 6 volt electrical systems with a positive ground. Ford didn't start widely using 12 volt systems until 1956. The distributor is driven directly from the forward end of the camshaft, which is pretty inconvenient when it comes to servicing. When the next generation Ford cars launched, they featured an updated design for the V8 that relocated a number of components, including the distributor, to a more service-friendly 90-degree angle at the right front of the engine. While the block, heads, and intake manifold are made from cast iron, lightweight aluminum pistons were used. They were fitted with four rings each to provide a better compression seal and reduce power waste. It also helped improve oil economy. Instead of a conventional paper filter element for the air cleaner, these cars used what was referred to as an oil bath air cleaner, which routed air in a way that dust and dirt would be trapped in a bath of oil before reaching the carburetor. It was claimed to be 98% efficient. The original Holley Model 94 carburetor is a dual downdraft design with manual troke and throttle levers on the dashboard. The engine's compression ratio is 6.8 to 1. The mechanically driven fuel pump is mounted on top of the engine at the back of the valley beneath the oil fill and crankcase breather tube. Another fun fact is that these engines used two water pumps and two thermostats, one set for each bank. While the V8 is certainly one of Ford's more memorable engines, the standard engines in these cars was a 90 horsepower flathead inline six cylinder. Ford claimed it was the most modern six in the low price field. Further refined in the later years with a similar list of upgrades seen with the V8. A column shifted at three speed manual transmission was the only transmission offered. The classic three on the tree shifting pattern is a lot of fun. Shifting gears is effortless and can be done with the flick of a finger. 
Synchronizers in second and third gear, combined with the helical design of the gears, led to smooth and quiet operation. At the time this engine was rebuilt, the transmission was gone through as well. Aside from basic maintenance and some small updates here and there, this car hasn't needed any major work over the years. It's been extremely reliable. The standard rear axle ratio was 3.78 to 1, while a 4.11 to 1 ratio was optional. When it comes to fuel economy, this car typically ranges between 16 and 18 miles per gallon. I also run 93 octane non-ethanol fuel. The total fuel tank capacity is 17 gallons. I ended up replacing the fuel tank last year and replaced the fuel sending unit to fix an inoperative fuel gauge. The fuel filler is on the driver's side rear fender. The decorative chrome trim was an optional accessory. This car has a pretty neat old school aftermarket powered gas cap as well. It was made by the Snap Up Gas Cap Company out of Ashland, Kentucky. It's operated by a button underneath the dash and is super convenient. Before I started shooting this video, I decided to go ahead and do an oil change with the car show season ending and winter approaching. I grabbed everything I needed from my local O'Reilly Auto Parts, including a stock style replacement canister oil filter, some Scott original shop towels, and some fresh oil. When it comes to classic cars, using the right oil is extremely important. My oil of choice has always been Valvoline VR1. While technically branded as a high performance racing oil, VR1 is a great alternative for older pushrod based engines, especially ones that utilize a flat tappet camshaft. VR1's high zinc and phosphorus content offers extreme anti wear protection and superior lubrication properties. While the technology behind today's oils far surpasses what was available when this car was new, most off-the-shelf oils do not have near the amount of zinc and phosphorus as they used to. For example, without the proper lubrication required for flat tappet cams, you can easily and quickly wipe the lobes of the cam. VR1 is not recommended in vehicles with catalytic converters. If you check out the link I have in the description box below, I have a link to O'Reilly's website where you can learn more about the benefits of Valvoline VR1 and order everything else you need for your next oil change. Now let's go ahead and hear she sounds.
The additional length these cars provided over their predecessors permitted the use of wide doors. In fact, the door opening of the Tudor sedan in particular is more than three and a half feet wide, extending behind the front seat. The hidden running boards are an awesome touch and make climbing inside effortless. With the seating width as much as seven inches greater than Ford's previous generation passenger cars, you can sit up to six adults with ease. The front and rear bench seats don't offer much support. They're soft and cushy like big couches. Tasteful color harmonies, fine appointments, and various bits of bright work added a touch of luxury to an otherwise run-of-the-mill car for the time. The Super Deluxe offered a choice of gray patterned mohair or broadcloth with a gray painted dashboard and steering column and gray painted window trim. The floor was fitted with a durable rubber liner for the front and carpet for the rear. The door panels are a combination of cloth, carpet, and vinyl. The deep seat cushions were built with a soft floating edge and their individually pocketed springs were covered with a thick, resilient rubberized pad that made the cushion gently yielding. The seat is adjustable forward and backward. As it goes forward, it rises slightly to better assist shorter drivers. The Tudor's front seat backrest is split 50-50. To make it easier for folks to climb into the back, the seat backs pivot inward at an angle to create a ton of space. These Ford bodies offer generous seating width and ample elbow room. Three full-size adults can sit in the rear seat with full freedom of movement. The seat is like sitting in a cushy armchair because of how much you can stretch out and relax. Even people over six feet tall have more than enough space. In fact, about the closest thing nowadays that comes close to this amount of room is a van or perhaps a full-size SUV, but even some of those aren't quite as roomy. The legroom you have here is incredible. Armrests and ashtrays are built into the side panels while built-in footrests at the base of the front seat backs further enhance comfort on long trips. One of the coolest features of this car are the rear side windows. If you crank the handle one way, the windows roll down as expected. If you crank them the other way and keep going, the windows will slide rearward, leaving a small vertical opening. The door handles, window, and ventilation controls are all finished in bright chrome. Appointments for the Super Deluxe included a rear seat footrest, front door armrests, assist loops in the pillars, rear seat ashtrays, and a fully equipped dashboard and instrument cluster. The instruments are grouped for excellent visibility through the two-spoke steering wheel. The Super Deluxe dash includes a clock, lighter, two ashtrays, a lock for the glove compartment, dimming control for the instrument lights, ignition keyhole light, speed control for the windshield wipers, starter button, and a grill to cover the single dash-mounted speaker if the car was equipped with a radio. A new remote hood lock, introduced in 1941, relocated the lever to the left side of the dash, just under the instrument panel. The horn ring was a handy inclusion on Super Deluxe models and enabled horn triggering from pretty much any position. The optional six-tube Ford Adjustomatic radio allowed you to listen to your favorite programs wherever you went. Tuning was completely automatic. Pressing the bar in the middle activated a sequential timing mechanism that would shift the set to the next station you want without having to take your eyes off the road. The visible tone scale and dial are indirectly illuminated to prevent glare. A single 6x9 inch oval speaker in the top of the dash gave full, rich, faithful reproduction of sound right up to maximum volume. The radio's controls matched the rest of the instrument panel fittings and added extra beauty to the interior. A foot-operated radio controller was optional. The optional heater and defroster unit under the dash allowed you to maintain a comfortable temperature throughout the car even in the coldest weather. A concealed electric fan at the back of the heating element circulates warm air through the car and across the windshield for defrosting when necessary. 
The fan has two speeds and is reversible to provide a direct flow for quick warm-up and an indirect flow for less heat. Both the heater and defroster are controlled by convenient knobs on the instrument panel. For additional cabin ventilation, there's a lever under the dash that you can push forward to open a fresh air cowl vent. A windshield washer system was optional. By pressing a button under the dash, a stream of fluid would be sprayed out into the windshield to make quick cleanups easy. The glass reservoir is located in the engine bay. The windshield wipers on these cars were vacuum operated. A downside with that is that as you lay into the accelerator, you have less engine vacuum and the wipers can actually stop moving momentarily. I've never found it to be a real issue, it's actually quite funny, but Ford offered a vacuum storage tank as an option, which would keep the wipers operating at the speed you set regardless of engine speed. This eliminated the wipers slowing down or stopping when accelerating. If equipped, the storage tank would be fitted to the left inner fender behind the splash shield. An overhead rearview mirror was standard, as were dual sun visors. When it came to storage, aside from the car just being a lot of open space, there aren't any compartments aside from the glove box, which has a reminder sticker on the inside of the lid for the original oil specifications for different temperatures and the recommended tire pressure. Beneath the graceful slope of the smooth rear deck is a spacious luggage compartment that's lockable from the outside. There's room enough for the whole family's luggage. To make for an efficient use of space, the spare tire is mounted against the rear wall, out of the way. It wasn't uncommon during this time, and even some time afterwards, to find spare tires mounted within a recess in the floor. By mounting it the way they did, the floor was completely usable. A sturdy rubber mat would have been standard to protect your luggage against scuffing. The original one in this car deteriorated with age, at some point I'll install a new one. The compartment walls were lined for dust protection. An automatic light that went on when the deck lid opened was optional. In the middle of the trunk floor, there's a little trapdoor for access to the fuel tank sending unit. If you ever had issues with it, you can get to it without having to drop the whole tank. This is a feature that I wish manufacturers would have kept for, you know, future decades. Back here is also where you can get a better look at the optional bumper valence mounted backup lamp. It's a Ford designed piece that illuminates the back of the car with a floodlight effect. The lamp is automatically switched on when the car is shifted into reverse gear, and switched off when reverse gear is released. Finished in bright chrome, it complements the rest of the car. Well everyone, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you all enjoyed the in-depth look at the 1948 Ford Super Deluxe. Be sure to stay tuned next time and leave a like down below because it really helps the videos a lot. If you haven't subscribed already, consider doing that too, and make sure your notifications are turned on. I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care.